Hey guys, this is Austin. I built the PS5. Well, sort of. So this is everything we should need to build ourselves the Xbox Scarlet or PS5. Now to start out with, we have AMD's Ryzen 7 3700X. Now this uses the exact same Zen 2 cores that are in both of the next generation of consoles. And based on what we know about the PlayStation 5 with an eight core configuration, this is a very close match. And with a few tweaks, I think we can get it really, really close. Next, we have the Radeon RX 5700. Now this is the very first of the Navi GPUs, which again will be found in both the PS5 as well as the next generation Xbox. As this should give us a very good idea of how these next generation consoles will perform. Take a grain of salt, and we can see just how close we can get to playing games at a full 4K60 or even beyond. I mean, technically, this does support 8K resolutions. These are very much the building blocks for the next generation of consoles, so let's get this thing put together on the test bench and see just exactly how well it performs. Now, Sony and Microsoft will almost definitely be using a proprietary SSD, so this is not going to be an apples to apples comparison, but what it is is by far the fastest option that we have available and should give us a good idea of the performance and specifically the load times that we can expect out of these new consoles. So, with the test bench assembled, I now have Windows installed, all of our games and drivers and updates all ready to go. Now, there are a couple of configuration things which will definitely be different with the consoles. So, number one is going to be memory. So, right now I have 16 gigs of 3400 DDR4 feeding the CPU, and the GPU has 8 gigs of GDDR6. Now, because the consoles will take advantage of an APU style like the current consoles, the CPU and GPU will be on the same die. So that's going to give a bunch of power savings. And of course, on top of that, they're going to be sharing very similar memory. So likely it will be GDDR6, but there's a lot of sort of ifs and maybes because there's a lot of customization they can do. Maybe Sony decides to put 16 gigs instead of 12. Maybe Microsoft decides to throw some DDR4 in there to speed up the CPU. That is all way up in the air. So to keep things as fair as possible, I'm trying to be conservative and give it the most amount of bandwidth and the most amount of memory that I think it could realistically use. So we have our Ryzen 7 3700X here, as well as the RX 5700. Now to start, I'm going to just run a series of benchmarks and tests with everything stock, because obviously this has a, an advantage of being a an open air test bench, but this is sort of the best case scenario. Plenty of power, plenty of cooling, and then we'll start tweaking from there. So to start out with, let's have the good old standard Geekbench. Now this is not going to be the most demanding test for the CPU, but this should give us a good ballpark specifically on how Ryzen stacks up to, well, I mean, not only the current consoles, but like, Core i7s and stuff. Oh wow, that's fast, okay. So for context, that's actually ahead of a Core i7 9700K on multi-threaded. It's not too far behind on single-threaded. That's a big, big step up from old Ryzen. We do know that Sony and Microsoft have opted to go for an AMD Navi-based GPU. So because of that, I've chosen to go with the 5700, which is the middle of the range option. So Sony and Microsoft will definitely customize this. So they might actually go up toward a higher spec, such as the XT version of this guy, or because of power restraints, they might actually go a little bit lower performance and they're gonna customize it with extra stuff like ray tracing that this card doesn't have. So it's a little bit of a guess. An educated guess, but it's sort of, I'm hoping that this middle of the range configuration is doable for these consoles. So first off, we have Time Spy. So this should give us a pretty good idea of the performance. Although again, this is just for the first testing. We also have a bunch of games installed that I wanna see if we can actually get to 4K60 or 1440, or whatever the case is. Okay, so for the graphics, we have our benchmark to beat, 8154, which if I check my chart here, is pretty similar to say a RTX 2070. I actually don't think I'm going to tweak the graphics card too much. I think this is going to be fairly close to what we'll get, but I do think that there's a lot of room to bring our clocks and specifically our power down on the CPU side. Eight cores I think is basically a lock for the PS5 and likely for the Xbox, but they will probably be running it a little bit closer to say three-ish gigahertz. My next step is to underclock our processor. Since obviously a console has much more limited thermal as well as power restraints compared to a PC, I'm going to not only lower the voltage but also lower our clock speed to get this in the same kind of realm as something you could expect to find in the PS5 or the Xbox Scarlet. So for testing, I'm using AMD's Ryzen Master software, which props to them is super useful. I start at 160 watts, and again, that's for the entire system. So there's probably 70-ish watts that has nothing to do with the CPU, but I already come from 160 down to 135. So I think if we keep this going, we'll probably be in the right realm for what the consoles can handle. This is basically the same thing as overclocking, except it's in reverse. So if we lower too much voltage, it will start crashing just the way it would if we try to push the system too far. 
So we have now crossed into my magic green threshold of that's actually roughly console spec. I can probably get a little bit more power out of it. Even though I'm lowering the power, we're still running at the same clock speed, right? So this is literally getting the exact same performance, but just undervolting the CPU. We're down to 34 watts. That's gotta be good. I think a console can pretty easily sustain that. Okay, so I think a speed like 3.2 is very, very doable on a console. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to validate it a little bit more, make sure that we're not going to see any additional crashing. And from there, it's time to actually test to see how well this games with the uh, console spec CPU. So let's take a couple of games that are out right now on current generation consoles and see what it takes to get them running at 4K 60, maybe even 120 frames per second. All right, so Metro Exodus is actually a fairly modern game. So I'm just gonna jump it straight to 4K Ultra. So where we're at right now is that this is the Ryzen 7 3700X, which is running at 3.2 gigahertz, which is I think pretty close to the console spec. And we have our woo, 15 frames per second. Mmm. 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 Oh, are you recording right now? Okay, so I'm in the middle of testing Metro and I'm getting some really weird numbers and now I'm getting some crashing. Uh, which makes me think maybe I was a little bit too aggressive with my underclock. There's definitely some weirdness with Metro Exodus, but we are able to get frame rates that are what I would consider to be well above what we can get on the current generation of consoles without any real penalties. I mean, Right now, like say like 1440p seems like it's probably going to be the sweet spot here if we really do want to aim for that 60 FPS plus experience. So that is actually pretty solid. So um, I'm going to put Metro Exodus aside for a second since that's giving me lots of weird er errors and the numbers just don't make any sense. But in Shadow of War, we've actually got 4K 60. We got a 64 frame per second run. Now mind you, that is turning the settings down to medium. So running on full ultra settings, it's closer to 40 frames per second. But this is still a big step up over current consoles. That, uh, that's reassuring. I feel better about uh, this entire project now. Because it would suck if I'm like, this is going to be the PS5. And then I put it together and it's like, oh wait, this sucks. So the next thing I want to try is hitting 120 frames per second. So both the consoles should in theory support it. And some TVs such as the Vizio that we recently took a look at do support a full 120 hertz. It's super smooth. And I think as long as we probably bump things down to 1080p, we actually might be able to hit it. Oh, look at that. Wow. So literally bumping down to 1080p, we're well above 120 frames per second, 155, 160. And this is very much CPU dependent because generally speaking with the current generation of consoles, hitting those higher frame rates is very difficult with their weak CPUs. But with Ryzen here, even with it being underclocked, we're having no problems going well, well above 100 frames per second. That is awesome, that's actually better than I thought. And honestly, I think it's a perfectly reasonable trade-off. If you want the higher quality, you can run it at 4K and get your decent frame rates, but if you do have a display which can take advantage of 120 frames or more, then actually bumping the resolution down to something like 1080p seems totally reasonable. You can see all the marketing stuff of, oh, it supports 120 frames per second or 60 or 4K, blah, 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 but this is actually real numbers. Now, obviously, all of this video has to be taken with a big grain of salt, but we are working with a very similar CPU, and the graphics, as far as I'm concerned, are probably going to be pretty similar to what we can expect with this next-gen console. We have the PCI E 4.0 SSD, which side note, all these benchmarks and games and stuff have been loading really fast. But this is very much in the sort of realm of what I think we can really expect to see when these consoles go on sale next year. And that's super exciting. The Witcher 3 is not a brand new game, but when you start cranking it up at 4K, it actually does get fairly demanding, even for very high-end PCs. And with the 4K resolution, everything set to ultra, 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 this is probably gonna be tough to run. I don't think we're gonna get a 4K 60 on this. We'll see, but. I don't have, what? What? Oh my god, are you serious right now? Great, my benchmarks start with a, uh, a fresh new save. We're getting a 47 frames per second here, 44. <laughs> All right, never mind. I'm glad that we started with the beginning of the game. You will be able to hit 4K 60 if game developers want to aim for that, right? So that's a big question. They still might opt to go for either slightly higher resolutions or more like higher quality effects at 4K 30, but 4K 60 very much seems possible. So now, of course, it's time for the most important test of them all, Fortnite. Because, come on, let's face it, Fortnite's gonna be on the PS5. Seems to run fine. I don't know what I'm doing right now. Um, we're in the 35 to 40-ish FPS range, but this is full epic settings. I think if we probably just notch it down to high, we'll probably be okay. Medium at 4K, we're at 90 frames per second. So some combination of medium and high settings seems to be what we need. Who's shooting at me right now? 
Oh. Hi. This is not the PS5, but as far as I'm concerned, it is the closest look that we'll have to the level of performance of the next generation until the end of 2020. Bottom line, from what I've been able to see today, 4K at a locked 60 frames per second seems totally doable with this next generation of consoles. Now whether or not we see high frame rates and all the other bells and whistles remains to be seen, but if they are anything like this, and I have really strong suspicion that this is a pretty decent look at the next generation of consoles, then there is a lot to be excited about.